Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to our uh, Dime March webinar. I am absolutely delighted to be joined by my friend and my colleague, Andrea Downing, for today's really important conversation. But before we go ahead and get started, um, let me welcome you all on behalf of the Digital Medicine Society. So my name's Jen Goldsack. I'm the CEO here. And for folks who may not know Dime yet, um, we are a global nonprofit, and our mission is to advance the ethical, effective, equitable, and safe use of digital technologies to redefine healthcare and improve lives. Um, in order to make sure that you all feel well oriented and welcome for our conversation today, uh, before we dive in, I'm going to go ahead um, and we're, we're just going to do a couple of housekeeping bits. So first of all, full disclosure, we are recording today's session. Um, the good news about that is it does mean that you'll be able to access the slides and the recording um, at the end of the session today. They'll be posted to, to the Dime webinar in case you want to share with colleagues. Similarly, um, while Andrea has a fantastic presentation prepared for us today, we will be sure to leave time at the end for questions and discussions. So there's a few things you can do. Um, when we get to the end of the session, you can raise your hand, not like this. Um, you can use the toolbar down at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, and raise your hand there using the reactions and we'll call on you live uh, to pose your question. The other way you can do it is to type your question into the chat box as we go. We'll monitor those and we'll be sure to get to all of those at the end of our conversation. Uh, in the spirit of uh, privacy and disclosure, uh, we also want to be clear that um, we prefer that folks on the line do not um, uh, transcribe this uh, discussion. We know there are plugins to do that, but the goal of this is for folks to really enjoy the conversation and not for us to be creating a transcript here. We don't have permissions to do that, so please don't. All right, now I feel like I can stop being the teacher for a second um, and welcome um, our guest. So Andrea, um, absolutely terrific to welcome you today. It's a, uh, it's, a, it's a really important topic and it couldn't be more timely for us to be having this discussion. But before we go ahead and dive in, um, I'd love you to introduce yourself, um, introduce the Light Collective, um, and maybe talk a little bit about how the Light Collective and Dime started working together. We were recapping on this last night, and there's a nice history here in terms of partnership between our two organizations. Sure. Well, you you and I, Jen, met a few years ago at DEF CON, and it was my first DEF CON ever presenting. Um, I... I'm very glad to be here and to talk about some of the work that we've been doing. Um, again, my name is Andrea Downing, and I am the board president and co-founder of an organization called the Light Collective. We're on a mission to advance the rights, interests, and voices of patient communities in healthcare technology. And so I'll get into a little more on the backstory of how, um, how we got here, but I've just been very thankful to be able to collaborate and partner up on this webinar and some other things with you, Jen, and uh, excited to get into this. Fantastic. Well, um, in that case, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, Andrea. I'm going to give uh, the keys here to you um, and let you walk us through your presentation before we dive into discussion. Sure thing. All right. Can you see my slides? Yep, we got you. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the deadly state of surveillance capitalism in healthcare. And I'm going to paint a picture for you before I go into a little bit more context of who I am and how I got here um, in just a bit of the backstory. So let's start with the problem. Uh, let's say you're a HIPAA covered entity and you're trying to great, get a great product or service to a patient population who you think may benefit from that product or service. So you want to reach people where they are. And we know quite literally because we're all on these platforms that patient communities and populations are on social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok, or even searching for knowledge on Google. So let's say your marketing department has a really great idea to create an ad campaign uh, to target the right patient at the right time in the right community in the right area uh, with this good product or service. Turns out there's a catch, and that catch is this. The same vectors that you can use to get to these vulnerable patient populations can also be easily exploited by threat actors. And when I say threat actors, what we mean are scammers, snake oil peddlers, 
troll farms that want to harass people, and also even nation state actors targeting disinformation campaigns. So this is why we need to think a bit more about meeting patients where they are. And over the course of the next hour, we're going to talk about our research, how we studied this over the last year and where it leads us now in terms of definitive guidance um, from both Health and Human Services and the Federal Trade Commission on uh, making sure that we are thinking differently about surveillance technologies in healthcare. So how did we get here? As Jen mentioned, uh, we met at one of the largest cybersecurity conferences uh, in the world called DEF CON uh, in 2019. And my backstory here is a bit non-traditional. I'm a BRCA community advocate, which means I, um, I came from a community that uh, is navigating hereditary cancer risk or our risk of breast and ovarian cancer. And in that community, we share a lot of deeply personal things in order to find our peers and advance our own healing journey. Um, and what happened was I started awakening to some of the big problems back in 2018 after Cambridge Analytica on you know, having patient populations without any rights or protections existing on these platforms and, you know, the ability to target these people at scale, people like me. Uh, so my path turned into security research. And for those of you who are learning about security research or cybersecurity for the first time, we're going to talk a little bit more about it. Um, I, I want to welcome you to this world. It's an important world to learn about and understand as you're building uh, digital medicine solutions, and we want to partner um, with people who understand that we must be more secure and resilient in the solutions that we develop. So um, with that, just a little bit more about the Light Collective. Um, realizing these problems um, back in 2018, before the pandemic, uh, we formed this organization, and it's entirely patient-led. Our board and our um, team is a patient community uh, set of leaders who recognize these problems and we're building capacity towards um, helping patient communities to better protect themselves. Um, so again, mission to represent the rights, interests, and voices of patient communities in healthcare technology. So that turns me to the research we're going to talk about today and the past year or a timeline that started, um, it's been quite a year um, where, you know, we did this research. I think now just about everybody in digital medicine is talking about cross-site tracking and the implications of that after some pretty high profile um, uh, agency enforcement from the FTC and we're looking at breach notifications from the OCR, but how did we get here? Well, I will start with some basic principles. I highly recommend this paper from um, the co-author of the research I'm going to um, share, my co-author, Eric Braxless. Um, I was originally inspired by this great paper um, back in 2019 with Eric and Rob Robert Califf on employing cybersecurity techniques on uh, against the threat of medical misinformation. But, you know, I think over the past for years, and especially during the pandemic, when we saw the World Health Organization term, it, uh, term this problem of an infodemic, we didn't really see the technical underpinnings of how information is not just spreading among a community, but how people can be targeted and aggressively fed or served um, disinformation in ways that can cause harm. So that leads us to some of the research that uh, we published last year in August of 2022. Uh, the paper is in Self Patterns, if you want to take a look, um, and it's called Health Advertising on Facebook Privacy and Policy Implications. So um, I'm just going to paint a picture of what we did in this research, and this is one of our figures. Um, basically, if a patient signs up for a service, um, that could be any uh, HIPAA-covered service, uh, or it could be outside the walls of a HIPAA-covered entity. 
Um, and they also happen to have a social media account like Facebook. Um, if that service happens to have third-party trackers, what happens is those third-party trackers, whenever you're filling out a web form, can pass custom fields back to platforms like Meta or TikTok or Twitter through these third-party tools. And there are ways to use these ads to generate uh, what we term in the healthcare world, PHI, and need to protect PHI in very you know, careful ways. Uh, this data was passed back without a consent and without clear path from um, you know, these third-party services to these platforms. Um, and so over here on the right, so th here's the backstory. This actually started on a dare. <laughs> and the dare was uh, a group of patients who were starting to see this incredible trend of, um, you know, oh, I'm signing up for the service and all of a sudden I'm being bombarded with these ads relating to my health condition. What happened? What triggered that? We started downloading our JSON files um, and our archives off of Facebook. And over here on the right, you see this little snippet of, um, a, a, you know, how that data showed up in our archives. So in this example, you see hereditary cancer quiz, which was actually an ad campaign from a HIPAA covered entity. Um, and it was passing these custom fields and page views. And we were like, hmm. What is that all about? Why are we as advocates who navigate back and forth between these services seeing this incredible amount of cross-site tracking behavior in our archives? What is that? So we started to look into a bit more and we started to you know, identify, and I'll show in this example, um, a whole range of third parties on um, both HIPAA covered entity service sites and non-covered entities. So this example is a non-covered entity, but it's a genetic testing site. And what you see on here on the left is a you know, strong statement of you're in control of your DNA. We care about your privacy. Everything is encrypted. Up here on the right, and this is actually a tool I recommend everybody use, EFF's Electronic Frontier Foundation's Privacy Badger. You can just see a whole range of third-party trackers where if you're filling out a web form, they're depending on how that tracker is configured to pass custom fields back. You may be passing your health conditions, your medications, your mental health status, um, your, your doctor's appointments, a whole range of information back with this party in order for that platform to then be able to read ads to you um, in multiple places. Um, so how do patients see this? What is what is the patient perspective or view of um, how this plays out in experience? Well, we see uh, here a range of chemotherapy ads. These are real ads that were served to patients in our community and aggressively targeted, uh, I might add. In the middle, you see an ivermectin ad. And there's nothing keeping the ivermectin ads out like in, in, for, in the form of a layer, layer of that was saying, okay, you know, let's let's make sure that when we're targeting, you know, we're a not using data about a patient that was acquired illegally, or b we're not, you know, targeting people with really bad things that might actually harm them. So here's our timeline, um, and you know, the timeline continues. This was just the, in the last year. Um, our publication, our preprint. Um, went public in January of last year and Wired pick it up, picked it up. The headline was health sites let ads track visitors without telling them. Um, our, our cell pattern story um, was published in August of uh, this last year. And there were a whole range of follow-ups and kind of cascading things that I've been watching ever since then. Um, so where are we? I'm going to share a few of those impacts now. <laughs> so as of today, uh, I just at, last week checked the um, Office of Civil Rights portal on health breach notifications and cross-track cross, cross that with which ones are specifically relating to breaches with Metapixel. And 
you know, we can see with these seven entities alone over the last year, um, we're impacting 61 million individuals in, in these breach notifications. And I think there's going to be a lot more, um, but I think that gives you the size and scale of um, how bad this problem is. So um, I think more notable and something that a lot of folks are uh, uh, pointing to and citing rightly as an example is this pixel hunt from the markup. Um, um, markup is a small outlet. They co-publish a lot of research with Stat News as follow-up investigations where they looked first at the 30 of the top 100 hospitals, I think, um, you know, U.S. News and World Reports hospitals. And they dug into this further where they were focused just on Metapixel and the types of data that hospital portals were passing back where these third-party trackers had literally been installed in authenticated portals of, you know, using um, MyChart implementations across multiple hospitals. And what they found was these 30 of the top 100, it's, it's a pretty common practice to find these cross-site trackers, um, you know, sharing back appointments, real names, types of medication, um, and other information, names of the provider uh, with the social media platform, and then that information can be used to retarget the patient. So as of February, you know, we're, we're seeing a whole range of headlines um, around this problem. Uh, I, I shared the portal breach. This is how it's kind of showing itself in the headlines. Um, and some of those you saw in the list in the OCR portal. But um, I think the thing I want to bring up here is it's not just enforcement from, you know, either the Office of Civil Rights or now what we've seen as of February, we're also looking at enforcement from the FTC if you're a non-covered entity. Um, I'll get that to that in just a second, but we're, we're seeing, you know, this is probably going to be something that is discussed um, on the Hill. And, you know, we're seeing some congressional inquiries around this. And um, just as of last Friday, uh, an, an, another incredibly large breach was uh, reported from Cerebral, which is a company that's been aggressively targeting ads for mental health um, medications and services. So um, if you are listening to this and wondering, okay, you know, how do I know if I am kind of in this boat of, uh, you know, you may be concerned about your or own organization finding out if you have um, installed these third-party pixels. I would take a look at, if you're a HIPAA-covered entity, the Health and Human Services Bulletin on this that was published in December of 2022. Um, it goes through some very clear guidance on this, but the, the you know, I guess net of the guidance is this, even if you're looking at unauthenticated page views, and this is really, you know, I think important to understand, you know, there, when you think about third-party trackers or cookies, this all goes back to, you know, these are different types of cookies. There are functional cookies, and then there are advertising cookies, you know, functional cookies um, that to make your website work better you know, uh, that's a very common thing that we see on websites. When we look at advertising cookies, um, we may say, okay, well, you know, just because somebody is viewing a page doesn't reveal facts about them um, that are being passed to the platform. But I think in this health and human services scope, you know, they made very clear, you know, no brainer, you need to uninstall anything from patient portals um, that is passing custom fields back to, uh, Meta or TikTok or Twitter, um, but also unauthenticated web pages. So if you're looking at a, we a website that potentially has, you know, information about how to get services for BRCA or how to get services for an abortion or HIV, um, these are really sensitive places where even though you don't know facts about the patient or that fields aren't passing back to a third party um, through this platform, um, you, you will be updating based on that user's browsing behavior, certain interests that can be inferred and used to retarget that patient. 
So the third thing is just tracking within mobile apps. We can't, there are a whole kind of a whole host of ways that you can track within mobile apps um, that are also not allowed. So again, take a look at that scope. Um, they also said, you know, if you don't have BAAs with these third-party services, you're not in compliance. Um, and by the way, no small print waivers of rights. So what we've found is in a lot of uh, non-covered entities, um, even some of the diagnostic testing companies we've looked at, um, they'll have in the fine print, um, you know, you waiver your right to take legal action or arbitration clauses. And a health and human services is saying, no, you can't protect yourself as an NDT just by having that in a really long privacy policy in the fine print. And um, also no post-collection de-identification. Um, so where do we go from here? Uh, you know, I want to kind of go back to Jen, and this is where our work really does intersect. Um, and I think this is a really good opportunity to start this conversation within uh, the digital medicine community um, and, and start with the paper that you, you recently published with Eric and Megan Rainey. Um, so I'm going to go there and uh, let's, let's kick it over to you. What do you think, Jen? Um, so first of all, Andrea, thank you for walking us through all of this. I think it's fascinating and hopefully we get a chance during our discussion to talk about your journey of getting to this point. But you're exactly right. I think one of the things that we noticed was that it was challenging for all members of the community and perhaps in particular the clinical community to get to grips with what do we actually mean when we say cyber harm and how does this relate to the kinds of harms and safety issues that in the clinical environment we're more accustomed to thinking about. And so the goal, um, and actually uh, full credit to Eric Pratt's list, this was his sort of idea, and then it was fun to work on this with him and Megan to bring it to maturity around what are some of the frameworks that we can develop that feel natural, that feel um, uh, aligned with how we think about risks and harms in clinical care today. So we actually came up with um, several frameworks that we sort of linked together. The first is what are the kinds of um, vulnerabilities and what are the risk factors for those things? And actually, Andrea, you know this better than anyone else, right? In the clinical community, you are part of a patient community that has these genetic risk factors for some downstream harm, right? Unfortunately for your community, it's a pretty devastating diagnosis. But when you understand those risk factors, you work with your community to actively mitigate them. And it's such a great example. And we wanted to translate that into the sort of uh, digital era of health and talk specifically about cyber harms. Mm -hmm. And then it's not just the risk factors and the types of vulnerabilities, right? Are you vulnerable because of your physical or digital environment, right? You're dependent on public Wi-Fi or because of sort of economic status, um, you are particularly at risk for downstream financial harm um, due to some of these things. Unfortunately, you know, harms are not equally distributed. And then what we wanted to do was link those risk factors to examples of harm as well. So it's not just vulnerabilities and risk factors, but then how can we actually triangulate there and talk about those specific examples of cyber harms? And what you've got on the slide here, Andrea, I think is perfect, right? It's so interesting to think about the fact that um, the fact that you go in for something like a knee replacement at the hospital um, and that through one way or another your data gets leaked, you can actually be vulnerable um, to downstream impersonation, right? People taking your financial data and essentially your full profile and creating a duplicate of that out in the world. This has never been something that we've been accustomed to in the healthcare environment. When you go through your surgical risks, that's just not on the list, right? But we are used to things like infection. So the purpose of all of this is we have a very effective way in healthcare of thinking about risks and risk mitigation. And how can, in the digital era of healthcare, we introduce these cyber harms into an environment that feels very comfortable for us and where we have proven success in trying to mitigate some of these things? And, you know, Andrea, you and I talk a lot about the fact that it has to be mitigation. Once this is done, once the data is out there, yeah. um, there's very little you can do to put the genie sort of back in the bottle. Um, and if you do want to, to actually, let's hang out here for a second because you and okay. I talk about this all the time. 
what's the thing, you know, as a representative from the patient community, what keeps you awake at night when you think about some of these downstream implications? So I want to make it really clear to anybody listening that I mean, if you're if you're thinking about how you mitigate risk for your own organization, the first step is absolutely to take down the trackers that we just talked about. As an example, a very clear example that's happening in real time of how data can be leaked to a third party. What I want everybody to understand is just because you take the trackers down doesn't mean harm has not occurred. And you do have an obligation to kind of follow through with breach notification and comply with the law. And let me explain why. What keeps me up at night is the list out there now of people who can literally lose their lives because that information is in the wrong hands. You know, when we think about the current geopolitical, you know, environment where we do have nation state actors out there meaning to cause harm at scale, Unfortunately, what I've been taught from all of my incredible mentors in the cybersecurity community is we are not in times where technology and data that can be used to cure us uh, can also be used to kill us if we're not mitigating those risks and becoming resilient to those vulnerabilities. So I, I think we need to all take a step back and say this is not business as usual. Um, I think what keeps me up at night are the lists out there um, when you think about threat models of people who could have their devices tanked or could, you know, use that information in a way that causes so much harm to that person that they take their lives. You know, I, I started this research because I was seeing in real time um, a, an incredible upswelling of communities coming to us and saying, this thing happened. And what it looked like is, you know, medication communities uh, or communities that are in chronic pain and they have medications are having a rash of break-ins to their houses. Or, you know, as I just shared with the ad targeting, that's just one example of ways that you could use this knowledge about somebody's health in a malicious way and, and actually cause harm if you mean to cause harm. And um, so, yeah, there's, there's there's actually a lot keeping me up right now, <laughs> unfortunately, but I, I would really just encourage us to kind of think about the, from the patient community's perspective, we want to partner and lock arms with um, folks that can help us mitigate these risks and also design technology so that this doesn't happen again. Um, I, I think that's exactly right. We start all the way upstream, uh, upstream with the design of these sort of technologies, these solutions, and then follow it all the way through to how we deploy them and then how we manage them once they're deployed. But Andrea, let's um, let's pull on the thread here because you mentioned some uh, mis and disinformation. Um, let's pop to the next slide for a second and, and hang out here. What we've spoken about is and actually, you know, published on this is this idea of disinformation as a service. And unfortunately, success in a disinformation campaign means that people step away from the healthcare that could save them, or they engage in practices and the sort of behaviors that put them more at risk. Um, it was Rob Califf, who's the um, commissioner of FDA, said that the highest um, likelihood of death in the US is now likely to come from mis and disinformation and people stepping away from routine medical care. But you can't target a mis or disinformation campaign unless you have a profile of individuals that you want to go after who by definition are vulnerable. So as we start to put these things together, um, you know, Andrea, do you want to give us an example of a sort of mis or disinformation campaign that's actually used the data from one of these sorts of breaches or one of these sorts of, you know, scraping tools to really cause harm? So I can't give, I will, I will caveat that with, I am in the process of expanding the research where I, I have stuff that I can't make public yet. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I would love to point to some of those examples, but a paper is in the works and I can't kind of spout all of them out right now. Um, but I will speak in general terms of, you know, there, there was, when you, uh, if you go back to the slide that I, I think it was the third or fourth slide where I was talking about 
troll farms. You know, you got a troll farm sitting in um, a country that we do not have good uh, political relations with, um, troll farm in Russia, let's say. And uh, they are wanting to cause harm at scale and they don't care about the um, outcomes for civilians. Uh, you know, misinformation looks like doing two things, setting up, you know, fake profiles of people that um, are literally a, a, you know, building full of real people trying to target a vulnerable population um, to harass them, um, to uh, give them the wrong thing. I will, I will give one example that is public that happened um, in 2018. I think it was 2018. Yeah, it was 2018. Um, there was a group of 15,000 sexual assault survivors. And I was um, unfortunately uh, had a front row seat to this when one of the advocates came to me after, you know, the platform was doing nothing. Um, basically, the, the group got taken over by hackers um, and they started targeting the women with some of the most horrific uh, content and threats about, you know, they, they know who their husbands are, you know, they knew who, know who their abusers are, and they're going to come find them. They pu published, or they would share posts of their children and say, we're coming for your children next. So putting people in that state of fear, um, targeting through a fake profile is one way that a troll farm could, you know, act. Um, eventually what happened after three days of um, being aggressively um, harassed and, um, I guess, threatened, the group shut down and Facebook did nothing about um, that to give any recourse for the women, but the data was already out there. Um, and, you know, in those examples where these women were attacked online aggressively, you know, they did have their physical locations. They they knew where these women were and, you um, once you have that information in the hands of a threat actor that means to cause you harm, that information is already out there, right? And, and you can't take it back. So even though the group went away, um, that harm can continue over time. So it, how does it tie back to misinformation, disinformation? I would actually categorize that one as malinformation. If you have a troll farm targeting a vulnerable population, um, you know, I would say disinformation would be setting up a, an ad campaign and creating communities around ivermectin or anti-vax communities and having threat actors who know better or who know that this is actually um, fabricated information sharing it at scale. Unfortunately, the way surveillance capitalism works and all of these ad tech tools is even if you are not meaning to send out a good product or service on these platforms to target the right population, you can, uh, you know, go through the same vectors to find the same people that healthcare organizations, HIPAA covered entities, meaning well, uh, want to target. So I hope that gives at least one example that's public. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's a it's a horrendous example. And I do want us to have a bit of a conversation about sort of the role of the FTC and like the their recent actions. But um, Andrea, I know that you've got a couple of slides here to close this out um, exactly. Um, really thinking about the patient perspective here um, and then we'll throw it open to conversation. Yeah, and I think I probably just said the same things that I want to reiterate on, on the last slide, but, you know, the effects of these things can be permanent. It's not, oh, we took it down, so no harm, no foul. We really need to think about remediation of data that's already out there. If data has been leaked um, from a HIPAA-covered entity, you know, depending on the threat model, like if you're in the HIV community, or if you are a woman who is pregnant in a, now a state that... Uh, could arrest you, or, you know, uh, if you're seeking an abortion, you are really in this category of you ha could have data leaks about you, and that data can be used to cause harm or used against you. Um, and, you know, it, it, it goes beyond just targeting ads or disinformation, you know, data can be weaponized. I think that's really the key here. From a patient perspective, we have thought you know, oh, it's just social media or, you know, 
data sharing is good. We want to share as much data in order to advance research. I'm a person who, before I got on this path, was one of the biggest free the data advocates out there, one of the most vocal ones from 2013 to 2018. And I still am that. You know, I don't want to give anybody the impression that our communities don't want to be a part of the research that is also going to save our lives. But we have to figure out different ways to do this that do not rely on ad targeting and surveillance capitalism if we're going to get there. Um, and I would just say, like, you know, every single third party analytics will you use in advertising or marketing, think about how that mining of data can also be in the hands of a threat actor. And if you see something that is um, concerning, come talk to me because I'm, I'm as I said, we're, we're following up on the initial paper and in the process of working on an, a new paper. Um, so I will leave it on, you know, I'm gonna reflect the first time we met Jen at DEF CON and I realized that I felt um, out of place as a person doing research on third-party trackers or how disinformation works on social media and healthcare, when you know the, the there's this gap in the cybersecurity community too, where we only think about how devices, if you know you have this really complex exploit, can kill people, right? And you know we don't want to do that, absolutely. But what it, it you know I think about there's a really wonderful piece from. Renee DeResta at Stanford, who uh, studies misinformation and disinformation called the Digital Maginot Line. And if you think in World War II, the Maginot Line is this really expensive, you know, border be in between France and Germany where it was like really well protected, but it wasn't, the enemy didn't get through the, you know, those lines, they went around it. They figured out ways to go around it. And that's always going to happen uh, with a threat actor. And I want you to look at this and think, you know, we're on the other side of this, these unarmed villages, these digital patient communities, and we need the help. You know, my call to action here is um, if you want to help us get ahead of this, come talk to the Light Collective um, because we're working to do a few things. We're trying to educate patient communities about what the risks are. Sometimes patient communities are seeing the risk and the harm, but they don't know how to connect it back to the bigger picture of what's happening. So we have some education programs around that. We're also just working to build this coalition of patient organizations that truly have an interest aligned with the community to make sure that these things don't happen again. Um, and we're figuring out how to move forward and we're very happy to work with Digital Medicine Society. So I'll leave it with that. Um, fantastic. Um, and I'm actually going to go ahead and drop a link um, for folks on the line into the chat here. Andrea, speaking of education and the Light Collective does such a tremendous job for the patient um, and advocacy community. You're also a member of faculty on our Applied Digital Health Ethics course. And I think that that's something for folks working in the field every day. Um, that can be an immediate resource. Um, so appreciate your partnership on that. And I did just drop the link for folks on the line. Um, I could go and go with questions, but I do see we've got a couple from uh, folks on the line. So I'm gonna ask the team, Pip, let's start with you and perhaps we can um, unmute Pip um, to ask her question live, um, if we can do that. Um, and then we'll go to Matthew. So are you asking me to, no, no, no. Oh, okay. uh, and I just realized I don't have the controls to be able to do it. So hopefully, can... okay. okay, there we okay. go. Okay, hi. <laughs> yeah, so this is something you um, you touched on a bit in the last part of, um, uh, of your talk. Uh, my question was thinking about the abortion laws rollback in some US states. Mm -hmm. um, you said about like leaking this information could be dangerous uh, because you know, patients, patients seeking an abortion could be... Um, that could be identified and then face legal repercussions. Yeah. It pretty much asked my question, but also like, is this tracking information like just deliberately fed to, um, to, to government agencies so that they can identify people who, who may be 
well, as it stands, breaking the law uh, as, as, as the state as the state dictates it. So yeah, double, double, double edged really. A bit more on what you said about leaking information, how that happens, how that gets into the wrong hands, and then to, to prosecution. But also, is there just more of a direct route where it's easily accessible by government? So let me start with the first question or the first part of the question on, you know, what's happening with abortion laws in the U.S., you know, in the rollback of Dobbs. And as soon as that Supreme Court decision hit, I was barraged with reporters asking me, um, you know, how how can women who are in these communities um, protect themselves? And there are a few things that we can do. But, I you know, I want to validate that, yes, it is happening uh, we are in a place where you know, if you go to an abortion clinic and that clinic has a third party tracker, and this is also something we're looking at, uh, that tracker based on those custom fields that are passing back to a, um, either a platform like Meta or a data broker, both of those things can happen and joining up your physical location, your um, health condition, the service that you sought, um, you could, depending on the state that you're in, um, have those, those lists brokered and sold about you either to government or, you know, I think in the example of Colorado, we saw some um, on a, a, a separate side, um, you know, there were, were lists being made of Catholic priests seeking um, on dating sites. And, you know, how do we generate lists of Catholic priests on dating sites in order to um, do something with that? So I think what we need to be very clear about is these lists are up to the highest bidder, right? It could be an activist group that is anti-abortion that wants to find these women and do, cause them harm. It may be, uh, you know, a very... Um, uh, conservative state that is a law enforcement agency that is actively looking for examples of ways to arrest women. So there's what I'm doing is giving you like I'm kind of real time spouting out what the threat model is in cybersecurity. What we do is we think about not what the best thing that can happen is, but threat modeling is what is the worst thing that can happen to a person if the information is out there in the wild. Right. So in this example, for women seeking an abortion, I would say the threat model is law enforcement agencies rounding these women up based on brokers lists that they purchased. And at the same time, equal access to those lists from, um, uh, you know, activist groups who mean to cause them harm. Um, and I, as I was doing that, totally forgot the second part of your question. So somebody tell me what I was supposed to answer. <laughs> You, I you hope pretty much helpful. captured it there like yeah and I guess the, the follow up is is this happening like is this just like the the hypothetical worst thing that could happen and very very much could happen or is there evidence to suggest actually um in terms of government uh, penalizations this is a route people are taking so I would say I I'm not in a place where I can talk about all the examples of how it's happening today but it is happening um, so I don't have that paper yet. Think about um, that as part of our roadmap. And Jen, I don't know if you want to add anything there. Um, I actually wonder if you could talk to us a little bit. So you talked about the how cybersecurity researchers um, engage in threat modeling, and you talked about... Yeah the identification of sort of worst case scenarios, how does likelihood play into that modeling? How does like not just what is the most egregious outcome, but what's the mm -hmm. likelihood of that outcome and how do we reduce that? How does that factor into your threat modeling? So likelihood goes back to how easy it is to attain information in order to cause harm. And in this case, let me give you the easiest likelihood that has happened. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, goes back to Rob Califf saying the leading, one of the leading causes of death in the United States right now is medical misinformation. And I would add disinformation to that. So what we can point to, and I have a whole host of headlines that I can follow up with on um, disinformation campaigns and how social media is riddled with ads that 
can spread information that is false or fake. And I think we've seen, if that is a surprise to anybody post pandemic and post 2020, I would like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not giving the exact citations because I didn't, I should have put that slide in my thing, but that is the place where um, it is happening now. Now, in terms of case studies where um, we have like cause of death, I would say the main cause of death that we can point to, and Eric did this really well in his last um, presentation that I did with him was um, the there was a cause a coroner in the UK that specifically cited suicide as a cause of death for a young woman in the UK. So, I mean, this isn't just a US problem, it is a global problem. Um, and, you know, having the coroner cite, you know, how she had been targeted, how she had been, um, you know, if she was already dealing with a mental health in issue and the platform knows that and makes it worse, you know, citing that as a cause of death is a real example of harm that's happening today and did happen. Mm -hmm. And we saw that too with the suicides after the Ashley Madison breach as well. There were an yeah. enormous amount of deaths as a consequence of that. So yeah, we do see this happening. Um, it's it's interesting too to think about how we get ahead of all this. But I do. There's an excellent question here from uh, Matthew Fleischer as well that I want to make sure we get to. Team, can we see if we can unmute Matthew, and then if not, um, I can give voice to that question in the chat. Yeah. Hi. Um... Happy to ask my question out loud. So basically, I was wondering if you're taking um, or if these apps are taking individuals' data and it's non-identified patient data and they're kind of creating an aggregate profile of a potential individual, could that profile then be linked to the person on the back end and become protected patient health information that is identified, even if they were just taking kind of small aggregate data, so saying, some individual search this and some individual might have these um, various health issues. Could they put all that information together and then would it have to comply with HIPAA? So I, I would say, I, are you asking, can an individual patient pull all of that together? Or are you asking, is that happening where they're pulling data from different sources together? And the why latter. they the latter. Okay. So um, I'll give you one tangible example that was in our paper. Um, there was a diagnostic testing company using something called Unified CXM, which there are these services um, and, uh, you know, some of them are AI-based services that literally are tasked with taking one source of data and then matching it up with other data sets that are available to that company about that specific consumer. So that targeting profiling is absolutely happening. It's a billion dollar industry, in fact. You can go to LexisNexis, you can go to Sprinkler AI. There are a whole other range, whole host of these where they're joining up data sets about us as con consumers. Now, originally that was designed for retail, right? If I go online and I'm interested in buying a dress from you know, Etsy or uh, you know, another place, um, you, you know, you want that whole profile about that consumer to say, oh, this person really likes blue. Okay. You know, target ads about blue dresses. Well, um, that infrastructure, I just want to be clear, Matthew, that it all exists. You can go to, if you just search on either unified CXM or you search on, um, I would go take a look at products like at ne Lexus Nexus to see some healthcare specific solutions that gather complete profiles around people. And in some cases, what's happening is we're terming, terming that in the um, healthcare space, social determinants of health solutions, because we know from a clinical perspective that social determinants of health is like the 70% of what happens with a patient outside the walls of a clinic. And so it's being kind of termed as, you know, this is the data that we can find out about an individual in order to give them better care outside of a clinic. Well, it's also the 70% of information that can be used to target people um, if, you know, those third-party data brokers are using the profiles that they're joining together about your location, your buying habits outside of healthcare, your health habits, your financial status, and then really getting into or honing into a population that they want to target if it's vulnerable. 
hope that helped. Yeah, that was um, really helpful, alarming, but um, very helpful. Uh, I'm curious. So I work at Levitt Partners. We're a, a, a healthcare consulting shop in DC. We help to run something called the Karen Alliance. Mm -hmm. which does digital health. I know, um, Jennifer, I think you know Ryan Howells. Potentially. Um, yeah, so I work with Ryan. Something we're working on is this digital blue button, thinking how do we create a digital health profile for individuals? Do you mm -hmm. have a concern about the link between having this, um, I mean, obviously it'd be an encrypted digital health profile, but are you tracking how this um, identifiable health profile is working with all of this other collected data and cookie system, is there any kind of concern on the market for that? Or what are your thoughts? I mean, there's a huge market for it. And I, be, I think, you know, you can point to billions of dollars in healthcare that are being spent on, um, you know, joining up these data sets from brokers in all kinds of different ways that are completely unregulated. Um, I absolutely love the Karen Alliance. And what I would say is, you know, we have, as an e-patient, I have for a long time been part of, you know, there's, you want to push a button and get access to your healthcare data and join it up from different places. That is a really good use of technology that can save lives in our community, right? And I think the Karen Alliance has been working on that for a long time, but we have to think about the second we pull our data from a HIPAA-covered entity and it becomes part of a PHR or what fits the definition of a PHR at the Federal Trade Commission, that's when we get into kind of the wild, wild west on, um, you know, who is enforcing this, who is governing what cannot be used um, when, if I put that tool in the hands of a patient community or good actor, it can save lives. I put it in the hands of a nation state actor, it can kill them, right? Um, so one thing I want to reflect on is we've, we've talked a lot and I've been part of these conversations. I love the Karen Alliance Code of Conduct, um, I want to point out what we're missing. And that is when we have a coalition of the willing showing what good looks like, that is an important step. But we have to flip that and also say it the harm isn't going to always happen from the people trying to do the right thing who are capable of doing good things with data that are going to save lives in our community. We also have to look at the coalition of the unwilling of people who are threat actors or who may knowingly exploit these tools in order to um, either further their bottom lines. They may not care about the you know, economic impact of what is happening to patients if these tools deny them care or jobs. Um, and those things are also happening. So, um, I kind of went on a little bit of a diatribe there, but going back to your premise, like, should we have that tool? I would say absolutely. But in addition to that, we have to go beyond a coalition of the willing into figuring out how we get these tools in the right hands and create regulations so that they're not into in the hands of people who are harm, using them to cause harm. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that feedback. Um... It's a really great insight and something I'll circle back with Ryan about because I think it's something we should Yeah, use. happy to talk further. Perfect. Um, and thank you for your question, Matthew. And I think it gets us to a really nice uh, wrap point for this discussion, which um, I'm disappointed to close because I think we could go and go. It's so important. But I think the sort of three constituencies that you identified, Andrea, are perhaps um, the most important thing for us to walk away with, which is there are these there's there are all of these actors with good intent who actually understand the risks and how to mitigate them. Right. Unfortunately, that's probably the smallest constituency in yes. this new digital era of healthcare. Then there's a very large constituency of people who want to do the right thing, are trying to do the right thing. The Metapixel is a classic example of this. Oftentimes it was trying to improve the patient experience. It was trying to make sure that patients were getting reminders about their screening uh, appointments that are you know, essential to their health, but no one spoke to a compliance officer. No one spoke to the CTO or the CIO until it was right. too late. It didn't occur to anyone. And so there's that area where we need to do better education. And I'm really proud of the work that um, the Light Collective is doing. I'm really proud of the work that our extraordinary education team here at DIME is leading in order to make sure that there is access 
to education for that constituency. And then there's the third piece, which are those folks who aren't interested in the education because they know exactly what they are doing. Um, and unfortunately it has you know, bad, dangerous, harmful intent. And then we need to think about what's the regulatory environment and what's the what are the consequences? And I think that's what's been, I think, positive about seeing the actions of the FTC recently is, you know, the bear is kind of awakened um, in, in this era. And I don't know if you want to make any other comments on that before we wrap up for today. Yeah, I realized that there was a slide missing in here. I don't know where it went. Maybe I accidentally... Not rearranged or something. But I think one of the other key things here is I focused on HIPAA covered entities. But what we're also seeing, as you say, the bear awaken, um, for many years, I was talking about enforcement of the health breach notification rule outside of HIPAA as the mm -hmm. one law that or lever that an agency can pull in terms of enforcement when they do see bad actors causing harm. And when I say bad actors causing harm, we are starting to get into a regulatory gray area. Um, and what we have seen in the last two months alone from the FTC are not one, but two enforcements. This is historic because that rule has existed since 2009. And they are just now awakening to um, the two enforcements were GoodRx and BetterHelp. You can go look at their enforcement actions to see what the details of that were, but my reading after the first take of it was um, a couple of things. They um, they both cited Metapixel without consent, so that tells us the research that I just shared was exactly what was included in the enforcement action, along with um, representations to patient communities um, that were not true. So um, go back and look at that. I think what it tells us is that if you're a Silicon Valley startup creating a digital health product, product and um, you're making representations to patients or gathering data to target them with the ads, it is no longer a place where you know regulators are not um, paying attention at all. Um. 100%. Um, so, you know, we would advocate always to do the right thing. And if that wasn't enough in and of itself, you know, there's now these incentives to do the right thing. Um, we only need to look at some of the fines coming out of all of this to know um, that not only should we remind people that our industry actually exists to care for people, and that should always be our first and foremost goal, um, but there are going to be you know, enormous um, sort of uh, damages that your organization will face, not just trust, but also financial, um, should you get this wrong. So hopefully the motivations um, to get people where they need to be, uh, regardless of their lens. Um, Andrea, I'm going to go ahead and close this out. This has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's always terrific to have these conversations. Thank you for all of the work that you do and that you lead in the community. It's so important. And we look forward to following along your research um, and continuing to educate the field together. Uh, thank you, everyone on the line for excellent participation and questions. Uh, and what I will say is uh, just a couple of notes on upcoming events here at Dime. Uh, Pip, who actually asked a tremendous question today, is going to be part of uh, a journal club. Uh, early next month, um, looking at the role of the patient uh, being at the center of developing uh, digital measures. And I love this title, The Patient Matters in the End Point. Um, and I think that's a, a good one for us to reflect on today. Um, we also have our ongoing webinar series and on March 9th, March, crikey, I can't even keep up. April 19th, um, we'll be launching a new resource, um, a scorecard for virtual first care providers. So that will be a good one. Definitely stay tuned. Um, Andrea, thank you again um, and have a great day, everyone. I appreciate you being here for this important discussion.